relevant data. Uh, in the language case, it appeared that universal grammar must impose a format for rule systems that's highly articulated and specific to language and is su uh, sufficiently restrictive so that the candidate languages are kind of scattered uh, so that only a small number of them can even be considered in the course of language acquisition. Otherwise, it would be impossible. Uh, to quote from work of the 1960s, uh, the most challenging theoretical problem in linguistics is that of discovering the principles of universal grammar which determine the choice of hypotheses, the initial conditions that say here's the class you can even think of, the accessible internal languages, uh, that's the major problem. Uh, at the same time, it was recognized that for language, as for other biological systems, there is a still more challenging problem, at least at the horizons, and that is still quoting from the 60s, to discover the laws that determine possible successful mutation and the nature of complex organisms. Uh, investigation of factors like those seemed too remote to merit much attention, uh, but they were kind of in the background, even in some of the earliest work. For example, on, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the field, the work on uh, elimination of redundancy in rule systems back in the 50s, uh, which was kind of implicitly guided by such concerns. And they do bear directly on universality in language, namely insofar as these factors, general organism independent factors, uh, enter into uh, growth and development, uh, less is attributed to universal grammar to the genetically determined initial state. Well, by the early 1980s, a substantial shift in perspective within linguistics had reframed the questions quite considerably. It led to an abandonment, total abandonment of the format conception of linguistic theory um, in favor of an, approach, of an approach that sought to limit attainable languages literally to a finite set apart from lexical choices. Uh, as a research program, that shift was highly successful. It led to an explosion of empirical inquiry into a wide range of typologically varied languages. Uh, a lot of new theoretical questions were posed that could scarcely have been formulated before. Sometimes they got at least partial answers. At the same time, this revitalized related areas of language acquisition and processing. Uh, another consequence relevant here is that it removed, the shift removed some fundamental conceptual barriers uh, to the serious inquiry into deeper principles in growth and development of language and beyond universal grammar. Uh, according to this conception that took over, uh, acquisition of language is dissociated from the fixed principles of universal grammar and it doesn't compel the conclusion that the format uh, provided by universal grammar has to be highly articulated and specific to the language faculty so as to restrict the space of admissible hypotheses. Uh, acquisition would simply be a matter of making some choices within a finite set, like answering a finite number of questions in a questionnaire, but the format, but the principles of language would be fixed independently of that and would always operate. Uh, well, it had been recognized since the origins of modern biology, since Darwin's day, that uh, general structural and, and developmental constraints uh, enter into the growth of organisms and their evolution, it was discussed by Thomas Huxley, for example. Uh, by now, such considerations have been adduced for a wide range of problems of uh, development and evolution, uh, ranging from uh, cell division to uh, optimization of structure and function of uh, cortical networks and complex organisms, even humans. Uh, well, assuming that uh, language has the general properties of other biological systems, we should therefore be seeking three factors that enter into the growth of language in the individual. Uh, one of them is genetic factors, the topic of universal grammar. Uh, these factors for the infant interpret part of the environment reflexively as a linguistic experience, which is non-trivial, and then determine the general course of the development of the languages attained. 
Second factor is experience, which permits variation within a restricted range. Uh, third factor is principles that are not specific to the faculty of language, uh, probably to the organism. Uh, this third factor for language, one would expect to include principles of efficient computation for computational systems, that's what you'd look for, uh, determining the general character of attainable languages and probably much broader in scope. Well, at this point, you have to go on to more technical discussion than is possible here, and I won't try, but I think it's fair to say that there's been considerable progress in uh, sharpening and moving towards principled explanation in terms of these third factor considerations. Now that considerably sharpens the question of the specific properties that determine the nature of language uh, with each step toward principled explanation in this sense. Uh, you gain a clearer grasp of the universals of language, but it's important to keep in mind that any such progress leaves completely unresolved uh, the fundamental problems that have been raised for hundreds of years. Among these are the still quite mysterious problem of the ordinary creative and coherent use of language, which was a core problem for Cartesian science and the first cognitive revolution generally. Well, at this point, we're moving into domains of will and choice and judgment and the thin strands that may connect what seems within the range of scientific inquiry and essential problems of human life. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the vexed uh, questions about universal human rights. Uh, one possible way to connect the dots would be by proceeding along the lines of uh, David Hume's remarks, which I mentioned earlier, uh, his observation, again, that the unbounded range of moral judgments must be founded on finite general principles that are part of our nature, though they lie beyond our original instincts, uh, which he took to include what he called the species of natural instincts on which all human knowledge and belief are grounded. Uh, in recent years, there's been intriguing work in moral philosophy and experimental cognitive science that carries these ideas forward, uh, discovering and investigating what seem to be deep-seated moral intuitions that often have quite a surprising character using simple invented cases. Uh, Liz has a lot more to say about this work than I do, so I'll drop it. Uh, but uh, just to illustrate, I'll take a real example that in fact carries us right directly to universality of human rights. So this is a real one. Uh, in uh, 1991, the chief economist of the World Bank wrote an internal memo uh, on pollution, not intended for distribution. Uh, in the memo, he demonstrated that the World Bank should be, in, um, this is mostly quotes, the bank should be encouraging migration of polluting industries to the poorest countries. The reason is that measurement of the costs of health impairing pollution uh, depends on the foregone earnings from increased morbidity and mortality. So it's rational for health impairing pollution to be sent to the poorest countries where mortality is higher and wages are lowest. And as he pointed out, other factors lead to the same conclusion. For example, the fact that what he called the aesthetic, that aesthetic pollution concerns are more welfare enhancing among the rich, like people like us care about them more than poor people. Uh, and as he pointed out quite correctly, the logic is impeccable uh, and any moral reasons or social concerns that might be adduced could be turned around and used more or less effectively against every bank proposal for liberalization uh, so they can be dismissed as irrelevant. Uh, this is all quotes. Uh, the memo was leaked and it elicited a storm of protest. Uh, rather typical was Brazil's Secretary of the Environment who wrote Chief Economist a letter saying that your reasoning is perfectly logical but totally insane. Uh, he was fired. Uh, the author of the memo went on to become Treasury Secretary under Clinton and later the president of the place down the street. Uh, what's uh, relevant here is the virtual unanimity of the moral judgment that the reasoning is 
uh, logical but insane. It's hard to find anyone who was willing to affirm the conclusion that does follow by impeccable logic. And that merits a closer look. Uh, it's one of these cases of very strong moral intuitions. And then when we look at it, uh, we get straight into the heart of the modern history of human rights doctrines. There is a standard codification of human rights in the modern period. That's the Universal Declaration, which was adopted in December 1948 by almost all nations, at least in principle. Uh, contrary to what's often said, the Universal Declaration reflected a very broad cross-cultural consensus, participation from all over the place. Uh, and all of its components were taken to have equal status. Uh, that is from what are sometimes called anti-torture rights uh, to socioeconomic.